Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm April Chief Messier. I'm president of the National D-Day Memorial Foundation, and we are so happy that you are joining us virtually as we kick off our commemoration of the 77th anniversary of the Normandy landings. We have three days worth of virtual and in-person this year uh, events that we're really excited about, and we really wanted to kick it off in a very special way today. So thank you all for joining us on behalf of our board of directors, our staff, and our volunteers. Uh, we wanna thank all of our World War II veterans for all they have done for this country. Uh, we are so honored here at the National Day Memorial to be able to tell their stories and share their experiences each and every day. So we thank them, we are grateful for, to them, for them. And today uh, we are especially grateful for this wonderful panel of historians, uh, distinguished historians who are joining us today, uh, who have also worked very hard on making sure our veteran stories are told. And we are so grateful to each of them for sharing those stories and helping to keep the lessons and legacy of World War II alive. So we thank them very much. And again, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our Director of Education, John Long, who will be mediating today's panel and introducing our panelists. And once again, thank you all very much. Okay, well, thank you, April, and thank you to all of you who are tuning in, both now live and who will watch later on. Uh, we're looking forward to a fascinating discussion of D-Day and World War II history in just a moment, but it's my pleasure first to introduce our distinguished panel of historians. And I'll start with Joe Balkowski, who served for many years as the command historian of the Maryland National Guard. He's the author of eight widely acclaimed books on World War II history, including a five volume series on the 29th Division uh, during World War II and a two volume series on American involvement in the D-Day invasion, which Joe is a great resource. I check it all the time. Uh, he was categorized by USA Today as the finest living D-Day historian. And I don't think either of our other panelists are gonna argue with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the founder and curator of the Maryland Museum of Military History at Maryland National Guard Headquarters in Baltimore, uh, which includes the 29th Division Archives, uh, which is one of the finest collections of archival papers in the United States related to the service of a, an Army division in, in wartime. The governor of Maryland recently awarded Joe the Maryland Distinguished Service Cross for his lifetime of service to the state and the Maryland National Guard. And I also happen to know he was a major inspiration for the career of our second panelist, who is John McManus. John is the curator, distinct, Curator's Distinguished Professor of U.S. Military History at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. I get that all right, John? You got good? it. Okay. Very uh, good. One of the nation's leading military historians, the author of 13 well-received books on the topic. He is in frequent demand as a speaker, and an expert commentator, having appeared on CNN, Fox News, C-SPAN, Military Channel, Discovery Channel, National Geographic Channel, Netflix, Smithsonian Networks, History Channel, and PBS, uh, and many others uh, as well. Uh, his latest book is Fire and Fortitude, the U.S. Army in the Pacific War, 1941 to 1943, which is wonderful, having received the Gilder Lehrman Prize for Military History and it is the first volume of a trilogy on the subject of the U.S. Army in the Pacific. So look out for the uh, other volumes coming soon. Uh, John has also published The Dead and Those About to Die, D-Day, The Big Red One at Omaha Beach. Uh, he wrote The Americans at D-Day, The Americans in Normandy, among others. And I'm happy to also say he sits on the board of directors of the National D-Day Memorial Foundation. And then our third panelist, uh, and uh, last but not least, and uh, Mitch, I'm sure you're used to being last on alphabetical lists. Um, <laughs> Mitch Yockleton uh, manages the National Archives and Records Administration Archival Recovery Program, where he leads investigations of thefts of historical documents and museum artifacts. And that is a fascinating subject. I would like to hear more sometime. Uh, he's been featured on 60 Minutes, PBS, and C-SPAN as well as the LA Times, the New York Times, and Washington Post. Additionally, Mitch is the professor of military history at Norwich University 
and the author of many books, articles, and reviews. His latest book, The Paratrooper Generals, Matthew Ridgway, Maxwell Taylor, and the American Airborne from D-Day through the Normandy Campaign, was published uh, last year by Stackpole uh, and has been very well received. Mitch regularly leads battlefield tours and frequently lectures on military history and uh, lives in not too far away from us in Annapolis. Uh, and I would also be remiss before we started, I didn't point out that uh, the books of all three our uh, panelists today are available through the dday.org webpage in our gift shop. Uh, go to dday.org if you're interested. We have a few autograph copies uh, even uh, available. So uh, thank you all for joining us. We are looking forward to a great discussion. And uh, I will interject every now and then with a question. But uh, as I told you the other day in our, our uh, you know, organizational meeting, uh, I'm going to shut up and listen to the three of you. So, uh, but I do want to start with kind of a big picture question on uh, the 77th anniversary. June 6th, 1944, when you get down to it, is just one day out of a war the United States fights for four years, Britain, France, Canada fight for six years. Why does that one day loom so large in our historical memory? I'll turn it over to anyone who wants to jump in first. Uh, since I'm last alphabetically, I'll go first. How's that? <laughs> I, I think it, certainly using uh, the term iconic, which we use for other campaigns like Gettysburg and Yorktown and, and others. Um, but Normandy is so important because it was such an important time in our history and the balance of the war and what was going on in Europe depended so much on Normandy and the fact that it, it um, the campaign itself, the planning had been going on for years and it was largely dependent on the newest ally, the, the United States, uh, to take the lead in this. And when I go to Normandy and I go with the tour groups that you uh, mentioned, John, uh, I always ask those people, you know, why are you coming? Rarely is it because they have a relative and ancestor who fought at, at Normandy, but it's more because they recognize the importance, um, certainly from watching PBS documentaries. Uh, Saving Private Ryan has a lot to do with it, but it's become such an iconic, important place. And we all think in the back of our minds, and I, I think this will be a question you'll bring up a little later is, you know, what would have happened had it failed? Well, it didn't fail. Um, certainly, as, as John and Joe have written about and the enormous casualties at Omaha Beach, um, but the Allies persevered and turned the tide of the war. And I think people, even, you know, almost 70, 80 years out now, we want to know why. Where was this iconic campaign fought? Why was it so difficult? And to be there on that ground, to me, is incredibly important. We could all do you know, research for years, but I think you really need to be there to understand it. Yeah, and I, I think it's, um, Normandy is kind of a pivot point in the, in the war in Europe. Uh, before the Normandy invasion, it's still possible that Germany could win the war. You know, unlikely, I suppose, but still possible. But um, once the Normandy invasion succeeds, once uh, France is liberated, once the, the back is broken of the German army in the West, obviously this begins to decide the war. And so you see this as a, a kind of major and seminal event in the history of Europe. Um, you have this, you know, highly developed region that has become this massive war zone in which all of these great nations have now gone to full extension of their resources to fight it out in uh, what you could argue is a war that decides on the future of civilization. Um, and I, so I think we've home in on D-Day because it is really like the first major step in that process happening. And of course, so much was involved in preparing for it. Uh, so many resources invested in it, so many people, of course, affected by it. Um, I think from an American perspective, too, it's the beginning of the United States becoming a, a military and economic superpower. Uh, Mitch had hinted at the fact that the newest allied partner in the United States now was going to have to take the lead. And that's you know, certainly true, especially for the campaign that will follow. And so I think that Americans kind of sense that and, and see the drama of the moment. 
Yeah, from the American perspective, uh, there's no doubt that, yes, D-Day was one day in, in nearly four years of war and six years if you count the Commonwealth. But I always view D-Day in the big picture, and that is it was really a validation of the overall grand strategy that was formulated by General George C. Marshall and, and other senior members of the American military. And, you know, if you look back on how these senior military chiefs intended to win the war, uh, it was very obvious that something like D-Day was planned for very, very early. In fact, if you go to the uh, graduation speech at West Point in May of 1942, which was given by George C. Marshall, he said to rousing applause in that speech, we will land in France. And that happened, that speech happened two years before D-Day. So Marshall, you know, essentially came down with the strategy that a democracy has to try to win a war quickly and violently. And he, he, he you know, to, to, put the, to put it in simple terms, he said, we have to put our best men against their best man and may the best man win. And hopefully we will be the best man. And D-Day established that that was validated. Yeah, you make a good point, um, Joe. And, and when we think about Pearl Harbor and the, the fact that you know we were attacked by the Japanese, it was decided by Marshall and the other allies that it would be Europe first, that our resources and our men would take precedence over the Pacific theater, even though we had a tough slog there, as uh, John has written about uh, um, in his book, in his uh, next two books. So you bring up a good point that you know, Marshall really dictated how the war was going to go from the American perspective. And the fact that we became the main ally, we kind of led the way. And, you know, I also point out in my classes that D-Day was the day that the American public longed for yep. in, in, in the long, terrible years of the war. D-Day was what the public expected and hoped would succeed. And, you know, I always tell people that just look at the headlines of the newspapers on June 6th and June 7th, 1944. Every single one of them says invasion. But, you know, there had already been many, a dozen, two dozen invasions in World War II. But when you said, quote, unquote, invasion has occurred, everyone knew that this was the big one. And this is what the public was hoping for and praying would succeed. And as you, as you know, that night, President Roosevelt actually, uh, over the radio, gave a national prayer Mm -hmm. uh, in support of this pivotal, pivotal day that the public had been waiting for for years. Yeah, and even the term D-Day, you know, obviously is equated with the Normandy invasion, when, of course, there were many D-Days. There were many invasions all over the globe. And, in fact, from an American perspective, the, the Normandy invasion was probably not the largest invasion. When you think of Leyte and Luzon and Okinawa, these are at least peers of Normandy for, in terms of the American resources poured into it. Uh, and yet D-Day is synonymous with that, uh, that, that idea of this larger invasion. And, and of course, at the time, um, you know, everybody knew where they were when they heard about the invasion. Every American, probably every Briton, I would think, and many other folks, too. Uh, you know, so there were there were pools leading up to it of people predicting when the invasion would be, you know, like betting pools and all that uh, um, and, and there were church services, too. You know, of course, FDR doing the prayer, but church services all over the country that day, just a Tuesday, you know, in, in early um, or late spring, early summer, whatever, um, you know, now all of a sudden became unforgettable. Yeah. And you kind of uh, led into my second question, uh, which was about the anticipation for D-Day. So many of the other D-Days that we had before 1944, no one really knew they were coming. Uh, you know, no one knew we were going to invade Sicily. Uh, you know, no one knew Guadalcanal was going to be a target, but everyone knew we were going to cross the channel sometime or another. So uh, talk a little bit more about what that meant for the world that was waiting for it. What did D-Day mean from 1940 to 1944? Well, I, th I think, you know, 
looking at it from the American perspective again is, you know, what that was one of our main objectives once it was declared that Europe first and we were going to be part of the coalition to, um, you know, unseat Hitler and to reoccupy Europe. But I think, you know, as the, the British and certainly Stalin and, and Russia, and we can't, you know, forget about all of that was going on in the Eastern Front. Um, eventually, the war, the most important part was going to be in Western Europe, and it was just a matter of time. I think, you know, perhaps a big fear is just like in World War One, when was the United States going to enter the war and would it be potentially too late? Well, um, the British and the French and the Allies really held on strongly. And who knows, you know, it, it's kind of one of those interesting things as historians, if the Japanese had not attacked, would the United States eventually have gotten into the war? I think it's an interesting. And would there have been an invasion of this size without the United States? No. I'll tell you, the one of the most meaningful events of my life was during the 75th anniversary uh, trip I took two years ago. And I had the, my first chance to visit Amsterdam. And I visited the Anne Frank House. Mm. Uh, and if you want to know what D-Day meant, if you haven't read the Anne Frank diary, read it. Because she, she almost never talks about the military events that are going on in the world. But when D-Day happens on June 6, 1944, she opens up her diary entry by saying, today is the day. And you know, you, you ask what it meant. To the people of Europe, well, that, that young Jewish girl summarized it all because it gave her hope. It gave her hope that the British, the Canadians, and the Americans would be walking through Amsterdam soon. So, uh, you know, th that was very meaningful to me. That's, that's a great point. And it, it was electrifying. The news was electrifying. I mean, Sicily and Italy notwithstanding, Eastern Front notwithstanding, D-Day, the Normandy invasion, meant that deliverance was going to be a possibility. There was still a perception in occupied countries that, you know, that it was a German continent before D-Day. This was the beginning of the end of that with the very people you wanted to liberate you, the British, the Canadians, the, the Americans, so on and so forth. Um, and it, I, I'll give you a, a sort of anecdotal example, too, what it meant beyond Europe. Um, among POWs of the Japanese, American POWs of the Japanese. It was a, uh, a guy who had survived the, uh, the Tan Death March, um, Colonel Johnny Olson. He had, he had survived Camp O'Donnell, which was one of the worst hell holes in all of World War II. And he was still alive, of course, as of the summer of 1944. And um, by that time, he's uh, basically a slave labor POW in Japan. And he gets the news. There was this clandestine network of, of war news circulating among the POWs. He gets the news, and it's just electrifying. Um, you know, it, it kept up their morale, his morale and others, for days. And you think, well, how would that really affect him? He's on the other side of the world. It's, he's fighting a completely different war. Still, that was the sort of powerful symbolism of, of D-Day, even beyond Europe. Wow. It's, uh, and... and I agree, and the Anne Frank quote was one that came to my mind as well. It's, uh, uh, you know, it it had to be just an overwhelming for the people who experienced the war. Um, we, of course, look at it as a historic event, and now uh, change directions a little bit now. And uh, uh, if if the Allies and civilian populations in Europe are looking ahead toward D-Day, so are the Germans. They've uh, poured enormous resources into defending. Channel Coast. They know the invasion's coming sometime. Where and when are question marks. And yet, by the end of D-Day, the Atlantic Wall has been breached on all five of the beaches. Uh, and uh, what mistakes did Germany make that prevented a successful defense of the Channel Coast? Well, I think the one that comes to mind, of course, is not getting the armor reinforcements onto um, the beaches right away due to Hitler having to lead that command and and sleeping in that, that morning. But I think also, you know, credit needs to go to the um, to the uh, FUSAG, the fake army and 
all of the behind the scenes um, intelligent work, intelligence work with um, the French, and it was it was a massive undertaking that I think that the Germans, of course, had no idea. They had no idea what was going on at Bletchley Park and other areas. So I'm not 100% sure, and I'd be interested to hear what John and Joe say, if there was that much they could have done um, to really prevent um, the beach. I mean, it was an overwhelming attack. There was a lot of inertia. And I personally credit a lot of it, having read um, the Overlord plan over and over again, that it was phenomenal. It thought of every possible scenario. And so I'm not really that sure that the Germans could have done that much to prevent what happened on June 6th. But let's not forget that June 6th was just the first day of what we call the invasion. I mean, it lasted quite a long time. And when people go to Normandy, they only they typically think of June 6th. And then they realize, OK, well, the, it, well, the war wasn't over on the end of the day. It continued on much longer. Well, and, you know, it, to me, I don't think it's quite as much about mistakes as just what had preceded it for two years, losing control of the air and the sea. Um, when that happened over the course of two long grinding years of attritional warfare in the Battle of the Atlantic and, of course, the aerial campaign over Europe, uh, it really dramatically reduced the, the capability of the Germans to repel an invasion. Um, so if, it, if there's any mistake beyond that, only my opinion, uh, I think that Rommel was on a bit of a fool's errand to try and fortify the coast in the, in the hopes of stymieing the allies at the waterline. If he couldn't control the air and the sea and the rate of allied reinforcement, it was going to be difficult for him to achieve that goal. And, in, and given in Normandy the, the hedgerow terrain uh, that is ideal for the defenders, perhaps the, the armor and other assets would have been better you know, utilized as fortifications there just to bleed the allies and create some kind of strategic altering a, a balance of power, almost the way the Japanese were going to start to do as of the summer of 44 and beyond of just bleeding the Americans in hopes of, of staving off total defeat. Um, so I, I don't really see it as much of a mistake as just uh, the sort of uh, the direction of the war, I suppose. I, you know, I, as, as you know, there were people in the German high command, probably a majority who thought that Rommel's uh, concept of defense was flawed including, you know, people who were his superiors. I'm not sure this is if uh, Field Marshal von Rundstedt is the one who said this, but I think he was. You know, he criticized Rommel's defensive scheme, and he is supposed to have said, he who defends everything defends nothing. And, you know, when you think about the, the length of the coast that the Germans had to, had to defend and the resources they put into it, it was a massive, massive waste of manpower and resources in the end, as John mentioned, especially with the Allies controlling the air and the sea. So, you know, I do think that some scholarly reanalysis of, of uh, Rommel's theory and how flawed it was is worth a shot. You know, I mean, what could the Germans have done differently? Um, clearly, there were several... Uh, alternative theories for defending defending Western Europe, and they were not put into practice, but ultimately it probably didn't matter what the German scheme of defense was because it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked no matter what it was. Very interesting point. I uh, want to take the, the question kind of from the other direction now, uh, not what the Germans might have done wrong, but what did the Allies do correctly because of course d-day for us is a great victory uh that gets a beautiful memorial in bedford virginia uh, but at the time goes without saying that no one knew that was going to be the case eisenhower very famously had his uh mess handwritten note to release to the press if the invasion had failed which tells us he at least foresaw the possibility uh so what uh factors on the allied side turned that possibility of defeat into the important victory. I would go back to my uh, point a moment ago about having a solid plan and working that plan and looking at all of the potential scenarios. But John, I take your point that you just said about Eisenhower. I think he was the ideal commander. Yes, he was criticized for not having the combat experiences 
some of the other Allied commanders, certainly Montgomery. But he was a wonderful organizer, administrator, and he was smart. He was personable. He was, I believe, the right person for the job. Not to say that if somebody else had been in command of Schaefer, things would have gone wrong. But I think having somebody like Eisenhower who was able to rally everyone, and it was a united allied front, and that I think helped significantly. And again, the training and the preparedness um, to me is just mind blowing. Every time I, I read about it and visit Normandy and I think of the task at hand and how well it was handled. Yeah, I mean, it, it, absolutely, Mitch. I mean, the, the, the planning is more or less first rate. It's exhaustive. Um, Eisenhower oversees and masterminds what is a, quite an effective team. In spite of its dysfunction, in spite of its Lee Mallory's and its bitter arguments here and there and, and rivalries in Montgomery and all that, regardless, in the end, he's, he succeeds in getting everyone on the same page. Um, and creating a, a good enough operational plan. And I think in part because he really took seriously that this was among the most challenging kinds of operations, an amphibious invasion in the face of quite a powerful enemy. And we're talking about a continental littoral kind of operation here. This isn't Tarawa. This isn't Guadalcanal, island warfare, where the dynamic is a bit different to amphibious invasions. Uh, so I think he understood that. And he understood that isolating the battlefield uh, it was going to be very important. Otherwise, the Germans would have some significant advantages in spite of Allied air power and sea power. Uh, so Eisenhower, for all the problems he has to deal with, does preside over a, a kind of positive and winning team that has this solid objective of getting ashore. I do think it comes something of a price of saying, okay, well, all, most of our, our resources and ideas and planning are on getting ashore and making sure the evasion succeeds because we know what a disaster will be for the Allied cause if it fails. And there isn't enough, um, you know, sort of mind space devoted to, to what you're going to do beyond in terms of ter terrain. And of course, this plays out in the hedgerows. And what I mean is the average infantry soldier is really a lot better prepared to deal with taking a beach than taking a hedgerow. And that's where you start to end up with a little bit of an issue later on. A, a kind of a minor defect in terms of the larger scale of the job at hand, though. I agree wholeheartedly with what you guys have said. I mean, Eisenhower's genius was keeping the fragile alliance together. And if you look at the grand scheme of military history, it's really quite unprecedented mm -hmm. that an alliance can function at that level in warfare. I mean, it's a it's, uh, uh, remarkable, remarkable achievement. But, you know, if you're looking for, I often say the number one pillar of the success of Operation Overlord that very rarely are people talking about is the absolute and total maintenance of secrecy right down mm -hmm. to the last moment. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened had the Germans had a hint of the plans 10 days, two weeks ahead of time, it would have changed everything. And how do you keep a secret like that when you're involving 2 million men, uh, you know, an entire island filled with military equipment and every single port filled to the brim with landing craft and assault ships? I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning when you think about that uh, uh, accomplishment in retrospect. Yeah. How, how, how that secret was kept right down to the moment that the paratroopers were landing in Normandy. I mean, even, even had the Germans had an intelligence breakthrough of 48 hours, it could have made a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. So it really it, incredible. Yeah. It, it, it's, and there were scares, you know, with the, the, uh, the crossword puzzles, the mulberry, you know, and other code words that were getting out. Um, the, the, uh, like I think Eisenhower classmate who he had to, to bust yeah. down or whatever and send home to right. the pub. Um, there was the, you remember, of course, with the, the weather and all that, you know, the, some units are moving early and thinking about invading June 5th and they get a little lucky that they're able to call them back. Um, there were paratroopers who got out of their marshalling areas and could have blabbed what was going on to average people. The wrong ears hear it. I mean, it is, Joe, that's an incredible point because it, it's some that uh, an enterprise of that magnitude to keep it that secret 
takes a lot of savvy, I think, and a lot of unity and, and a little bit of luck, too. And, and they had all the above, didn't they? Yeah, and I think from the very beginning, the intelligence was so important. When you look at the early stages of the overlord planning, you see in, in the discussions made about, you know, who needs to know this aspect of the plan. And, and you make a good point, John. I mean, that marshalling area, they were giving the paratroopers really the minutia detail of what they were going to do once they got close to the drop zones. And if somehow any of that had leaked out in a pub or somewhere, like Joe said, it, it could have changed the course of the battle. Even the fact that the Germans had introduced a, um, a division um, right where the 82nd was going to drop and they had to change that plan fairly quickly. But the fact that they were able to do that, um, it's just, to me, it's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. I'll look at a couple of what ifs. Uh, if the Germans had had 48 or 72 hours notice, they could have put a substantial number of night fighters in among the uh, C-47 transport streams dropping the paratroopers. They could have deployed their secret weapon, the pressure mine, which the Hitler had held back until after D-Day because he didn't want to give the secret away. And when the pressure mine was deployed after D-Day, it wreaked havoc on Allied shipping. Had that happened, uh, the, 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 the uh, assault fleets might have been decimated before they got to Normandy. Right. The, e -boat, the e boats out of Cherbourg could have made terrible, terrible attacks as they did in Operation Tiger. Mm -hmm. um, the invasion could have been stymied or, or you know, uh, half uh, paralyzed before it even began. So, right. I, you know, I consider that one of the, you know, the pillar. Yeah. And from a land perspective, um, let's say they know where and when the invasion is coming and you get people ashore or whatever, uh, you know, to me, the success of Operation Overlord on, on land depends upon isolating the battlefield which is what the transportation plan of bombing the French rail network and all that was about, and also the intel plan, the, the, the uh, deception plan, Operation Fortitude. Um, but let's imagine they know where and when. Well, that's one thing that could bring about some level of unity, unity in the German high command is to start moving troops to wherever the invasion is going to be, and thus you're dealing with a tougher issue on the beachhead. Um, so there's a lot of levels and layers to, the, to this intel or you know, secrecy issue. Right. Excellent. And uh, I think you can make the argument the Germans should have seen it coming. They, uh, yeah, they I, I, yeah. could have. I mean, maybe could have might okay. be fair to them. Um, it, they certainly had signals, and there were some who, who kind of knew and were guessing, but no one knew for sure. And I, I think one of the reasons, too, and I think we, I think we as Americans tend to overlook this, is the, the British intel side to this whole thing, uh, how they had re either neutralized or turned or captured, whatever term you want to use, pretty much every German agent in in Britain and were kind of, you know, sort of head faking the Abvar, the, the German intel service, um, and, and feeding a lot of the info to the Germans that, that they wanted them to know. Um, once you have that kind of supremacy on the intelligence front, uh, you've got a lot of the initiative and you've got a lot of assets on your side. So I think the Germans were in a way doing the best they could under the handicap they had. Plus the other thing too, weather wise, they had lost the battle of the Atlantic, which meant that they didn't have as good, as good a weather information as the allied had allies had from, from weather stations in the North Atlantic and thus could not necessarily know quite as much about what was possible on, uh, on June 6th in terms of dealing with the weather. Well, you know, rem remember that the target invasion originally was May 1st, 1944. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about the uh, scheme of Operation Overlord, it made much, much more sense to do the invasion on May 1st because you get another month of really good campaigning weather to liberate yes. Western Europe. When you delay the invasion to June 6th, you're losing five weeks of great, great weather. And it, it's, it's possible that the German high command was befuddled by the fact that nothing had happened by June 6th. You know, they said, wow, you know, man, they, they didn't come in April, they didn't come in May, and here it is the first week of June and they're still not here. What the hell, maybe, maybe the plan is that, you know, they just want to tie us down in France so that the Russians can move into Germany. Mm. But, you know, um, clearly they, they were caught napping, you know. Yeah. By, by the actual invasion. 
as amazing and, and as that may be. Then also, too, Operation Diadem had happened, where the Allies would double down on the Anzio beachhead and launch this major offensive in late May. Um, and so from a German perspective, you might be thinking, well, okay, I guess they're investing their resources here rather than invading France for now. That could have been another factor, too, and why they're kind of mystified. Right. Good point. Yeah. Leah, before we go on to the next question, let me remind uh, viewers if you have any questions for our panel, uh, you can type them into the chat feature or the QA, whichever uh, you see in, on the screen, you know, what format you're using. But uh, uh, we will try to get to as many questions at the end of our discussion as possible. Go ahead and put them into your, your chat feature. Uh, but let's let's uh, take it from the big picture down to some individual stories. Uh, for a moment. As uh, you're aware, and probably a lot of our viewers are aware as well, only four medals of honor were awarded for action on D-Day itself. One went to a general with a very well-known last name, and three to uh, soldiers of the 1st Division, which means no one in the 29th, no one in the 4th except for General Roosevelt, no paratrooper, no engineer, no armor, no one in the Navy or the Coast Guard. Uh, and I, I, I think there's a consensus with a lot of D-Day buffs that four was not nearly enough. There could have been many other medals of honor awarded. So um, uh, do you have an example of heroism that perhaps could have and should have been better recognized? Well, I'll start. Um, during my research for the paratrooper generals, focusing, of course, on the airborne, um, Lafayette, uh, the 82nd Division sector, a very important battle, securing the bridge there and the causeway, which would help the fourth uh, coming through Utah Beach and, of course, the later link-ups. It was a fierce fight. Um, it was you know, reminiscent of Gettysburg, a, a more than three-day battle, which the Americans, it was... Uh, the fight was never certain of how it was going to turn out. And you've got a major uh, from a battalion in the 82nd guy named Kellum, uh, Frederick Kellum, who helps secure the bridge, helps rally the men after having to regain his composure from jumping in. And um, he's killed on June the 6th. The bridge eventually, after it is taken with help from um, – a, a tank unit that came ashore later on in the day and then later on in the week. Um, Kellum, the bridge is named for him, the Lafayette Bridge. And when you read about his account, uh, you wonder, you know, he got the Silver Star, but why was he not um, brought forward and uh, eventually for the Medal of Honor? So he's somebody that I think about, especially when I go to that part of Normandy. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take my turn. Having been involved in, you know, the, uh, the decoration process within the military, it's a very, you know, I'll, I'll make an understatement here. It's a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the D-Day opening invasion force, you have uh, nine assault regiments, six paratrooper regiments, two on Omaha Beach and one on Utah Beach. Only two of those nine regiments had been in combat before, the 504th, I'm sorry, the 505th Parachute Infantry and the 16th Infantry of the 1st Division. So you look at the Medals of Honor on D-Day, and you see that the 1st Division did what it should have done to recognize the valor of its men. And they did that because they had had a, a tremendous experience in, in the Mediterranean and Sicily about how to... Uh, recognize uh, valor when you saw it, and when and when Omaha Beach happened, they they kicked into high gear and did what they were used to doing. Yeah. The regiments that had not been in combat, in particular the 116th Infantry, which was the mirror image landing the force with the 16th on Omaha, had never been in combat before, and as a consequence, it's really kind of stunning. They didn't really know that they'd have to get. Get in, get in gear and, and start to recognize the valor right away and look into who did what. In fact, it's quite stunning to me. You know, I wrote five books on the history of the 29th Division, and it is not until April of 1945 
only a couple of weeks before the war ends that the first 29th Division soldier is awarded a Medal of Honor. And they were so, I think they were so guilty about that that they had to go back retroactively eight, nine, ten months to find two guys that they had to give Medals of Honor to because they were so uh, troubled by the fact that here they were losing 20,000 men in World War II and they never put a guy up for a Medal of Honor. So in answer to your question, John, I mean, I don't think anybody on this panel would disagree with me. Uh, Brigadier General Norman Coda, um, uh, I'll come right out and flat out say it. He, he deserves the Medal of Honor. If you read the, the requirements for a Medal of Honor in Army regulations, he met every one of them. Uh, he put his life on the line a dozen times and came near death mm -hmm. a half dozen times on D-Day and is even quoted. In, in literature, in, in correspondence that happened right after the invasion that somebody said, why do you do what you do? Why do you risk your life like that? You're a general officer. And, and, and he, 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 he came right out and said the truth that I think is the foundation of why he deserves a Medal of Honor. He said, I'm 51 years old, and if the men see that I can do it, they will do it. And he said, frankly, it is much better that a 51-year-old person die than a 20 year old person die so if you want if you want the candidate from my perspective it's norman v Coda. yeah is there not currently an effort uh, there is an the effort government? there is an effort but it's been frustrated uh, by the army um it's been uh, it's been a it's been I'll put it delicately. It's been a very, very frustrating uh, process. It was turned down. Uh, trying to do it again. We had, you know, we had, we got new witnesses. We got General John Ron, who I'm sure you guys on the panel know. John Ron personally witnessed what Norman Coda did. John Ron is 99 years old now. He's the last surviving member of the class of West Point, class of 43. And he came right out in an email to me and he said, General Coda deserves a Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. But it was turned down. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the more I've studied Medals of Honor over the years and Acts of Valor and all that, the, the more subjectivity there seems to be to so much of it. And it's really not to impugn anybody who did get awarded the medal. But I've almost formed the opinion that for everyone who got it, there's probably five, six, seven, eight others who probably could have or should have too. There were a lot of distinguished service crosses or, or even silver stars, you know, like, like Mitch was saying, that, that you'd say, well, why wouldn't this be the Medal of Honor? Uh, so, you know, far be it for me to, to pile on since the, the Big Red One got three of the four Medals of Honor. But nonetheless, <coughs> you think there were other people who could have, in the division, who could have gotten Medals of Honor for D-Day, most notably Tech Sergeant Phil Stresick. Uh, who's uh, a key part of one of the first groups to get off Omaha Beach on D-Day, uh, a heavily combat experienced guy. And he has, you know, sort of multiple acts of valor that you can document and chronicle throughout the day that really are not only remarkable, but make a major difference to the outcome of the battle of, at Omaha Beach. Um, so Stresic got the Distinguished Service Cross, and that's obviously an amazing decoration. But I, I would think he could get the Medal of Honor, too. Um, but of course, you know, there's a lot of paratroopers too, um, and, and a lot of other yeah. folks who should be considered. You know, John, you bring up a, a sorry, a good point. When you look at the citations for Distinguished Service Cross, for example, and you you look at them and you think, well, why was that not elevated to the MOH? Because um, when you look at the heroics that some of these guys did. It's just amazing. And you think, well, how did they decide a distinguished service cross and not the Medal of Honor? And mm -hmm. it's so subjective, as you point out. Well, you know, the original Jimmy Monteith distinguished service mm -hmm. cross would have remained a distinguished service cross if Dwight D. Eisenhower had not written in pen on the, on the recommendation. He said, I think it looks like a Medal of Honor to me. <laughs> Yep. And that's at the National Archives, and I've seen it. So, um, and that's what got him the award, you know? Yep. Sometimes that's what so, it takes. What well, it and it was mentioned about T.R. Jr. getting the Medal of Honor. Of course, that was posthumous, but um, I've seen the paperwork at the archives as well, perhaps you guys. Mm -hmm. And it was a big fight um, mm -hmm. within First Army to decide whether or not. And I think his name arguably had something to do with it. And of course, his father, I've written about um, 
had fought heavily for the Medal of Honor for the uh, San Juan Heights and didn't get it until the Clinton administration. So it, it is very objective, subjective, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I might also add uh, Britain only awarded one Victoria Cross. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, it seems to be alliance wide. Um, right. Oh, well, great. Uh, go in another direction again and talk about a little bit of our uh, popular memory of D-Day. Next year is, uh, believe it or not, the 60th anniversary of the epic film The Longest Day, uh, based, of course, on Cornelius Ryan's groundbreaking work of on oral history. Um, and uh, what is your favorite part of that movie, and maybe what is your least favorite part of hmm. the longest day. Well, I, I'll confess, I rewatched it over the weekend in preparation for your question, John. Um, I like the movie a great deal. I have forgotten how well it was made, the cinematography, I think the acting, and that, those are two of my favorite parts of the movie where I might nitpick it a little is maybe the, the casting, for example, the British actor who... Um, portrays Captain Stagg, the meteorologist. I think there's like a 10-year gap in age between uh, the actor being much older than the real Stagg, that, that, that sort of thing. But I think it brings home in a one-day story, and I love the book. I think um, The Longest Day is my favorite book on D-Day and being able to just encapsulate the whole, what happened from the early morning with the paratrooper, well, of course, the and the Navy and, and so forth. I think you come away from that movie um, getting a really strong understanding of what the men, but also the women and the civilians went through. And, and that's one of the strengths of Cornelius Ryan. He was lucky enough that when he did the book, there were so many people. And the fact that the Germans speak German in the movie and they have the subtitles, I, I think it's a wonderful film. Yeah. I, I, go, yeah go, go on, on John. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Joe. Uh, I saw The Longest Day when I was, uh, I think I was eight when, I, when it came out, back in an opening when you actually had to have a ticket for a seat, and you had to get a, a pre-purchased ticket with an assigned seat, and I went with my father, who was a World War II veteran, he was not a D-Day veteran, but it was very, very meaningful to me in my life as a whole, to be eight or nine years old and sit next to my father watching that movie because, you know, that was the quintessential World War, World War II movie of its time. You know, it was less than 20 years after the invasion. I was very curious about my father's reaction and, you know, he, he really loved it. Um, and it, so it meant something to me as a human being to see that, that he regarded this movie as real. But my favorite part of the movie is, you know, I think there's a there's a direct relation with how much you know about a subject and how you view a Hollywood movie. So I'll, I'll start with the least favorite part. I, I found my the least favorite part is the scenes with the aforementioned General Coda, played by Robert Mitchum, mm -hmm. storming off of Omaha Beach. You know, I, I know enough about what actually happened to know that that was grotesquely... Um, Shall we say altered? <laughs> um, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, it, it gave a general idea, but it was not well done. Uh, but on the other hand, I found the drama of uh, a paratrooper sitting in a dark C-47 with flak going off outside the airplanes. That, that to me was, uh, that was heart, uh, uh, you know, the, my heart was pounding during that. I remember that vividly. That was very well done, how they pulled that off. So, Even the glider scene, you're yeah. in the in the glider and it's coming down. I mean, that's something out of like Disney. Yeah, yeah. that's well done. Well, and plus, you know, Joe talking about Coda. Plus, they put Taylor's words in his mouth. Two kinds of people going to be on this beach: the dead and those about to die. And I, you know, I, I just can't forgive that. You know, that's one of the things I really dislike about the movie. <laughs> is is Coda yeah. didn't say that. Colonel George Taylor, the 16th right. infantry, said that. It, as far as what I love about it. 
uh, the panorama, the sense of urgency of this this event unfolding before your eyes, almost as if you've kind of gone back in time and you're you're experiencing it as a fly on the wall in all these different settings and I, the different perspectives, which uh, you know Mitch had mentioned, that is so Ryan's strength. You know that that that's just amazing. Um, the other things that I didn't like, you know, the, you see the the beginning of two major myths that really are kind of still uh, with us today. The John Steele on the on the uh, you know, George Howard, Sam Eragles thing, which almost certainly never happened. Uh, the Red Buttons character, to, to put it in perspective, and the the Rangers getting to the top of Point to Hawk and the guns not being there, and we came all the way up up here for nothing. Well, no, even without the guns, it wasn't for nothing. That was an important piece of terrain, and they were going to find the guns. You know, so um, you know, as far as what I don't like about the movie, it's it's those aspects of it. Uh, but but of course, overall, it's just an amazing film. And you know yeah. the, the the re as people have re uh, examined the longest day, a lot of things have come out that just couldn't have happened. Uh, somebody mm -hmm. just commented on the sidebar about Major Pluscott of the 352nd yeah. German Infantry Division and that really mm -hmm. pivotal scene about how he sees the invasion fleet mm -hmm. coming out of the mist. Well, recent scholarship points out that he was you know five ten miles away from the coast when the yeah invasion began and he, and he just pulled a fast one on Cornelius Ryan. I'm not an expert, but that's what they say. So mm. uh, yeah, that's probable. I've looked into it as well and I, I think that's what happened. Yeah. Right. I, I would uh, concur, John, about the Rangers and, and the uh, sort of myth that the Ranger effort was wasted. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I trace back to Cornelius Ryan. Uh, I don't think he meant it maliciously. I think he just wrote the oral history as he collected it. Uh, but uh, as I often point out, a tour is here when I speak to visitors about, about uh, Point de Hook. Um, that's the high ground above the battle. And you've got to have the high ground above the battlefield, no matter what. So uh, Both beaches, both Omaha and Utah. You want that high yeah. ground. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the guns were there. They just weren't right. in there places. Right. Oh, and you want those guns. And so, you know, I mean, and you want that road inland too, uh, to, to control movement. So the Ranger mission is vital. And they, unfortunately the movie just conveys a kind of a different, mm -hmm. whip, you know, but, but we understand. And uh, there may be a few viewers watching saying, what is this longest day movie? The great weekend to watch. It. So mm -hmm. find it. I don't know if it's on Netflix or Hulu or anywhere, but, uh, Get a copy from your library and watch it this weekend. It's, it, uh, you, you won't regret it. Um, we'll go a little bit forward with a movie probably a lot, a lot of people are more familiar with, Saving Private Ryan, uh, that really did so much to raise awareness of D-Day uh, in, in uh, 1998 when it came out. So let me ask you the same question. What do you like about that movie and what is your least favorite part about Saving Private Ryan? Well, I think you said it all in the sense of it, it did bring up an awareness of D-Day and to Steven Spielberg's credit and help from Stephen Ambrose and, of course, Tom Hanks, a great actor. It, it made people more aware. I'm sure visitation at the ABMC site, uh, the cemetery increased, just like uh, when um, Ken Burns did the Civil War series, the Park Service sites where things, the Civil War blossomed. Um, I, I would say that's the strength. Um, there are a number of things about the movie that I could certainly nitpick, including the main story of sending this squadron after a soldier. You would think that since they knew what uh, division he's in, they would have contacted General Taylor and he would have had sent somebody out. So I thought that was apocryphal and they even bring it up within the movie. I felt like uh, the movie itself, and I watched it again over the weekend, is kind of a composite of every World War II movie with the dialogue. And, and, and there was some dialogue in there. I'll be curious to know what John and Joe say about this, where I, I can't remember who it was, but he's commenting about Montgomery being bogged down. And, you know, this he, he's always liked it. I'm thinking, well, how would the average soldier at this point in the war know much about Montgomery. And there was other sort of dialogue within the movie that made me think this is a little bit kind of silly, very farcical Hollywood. But, and it was kind of, it had a very heavy Stephen Ambrose influence um, to the movie, I think. So it's a good movie. It's a movie. 
And we have to all keep that in perspective, just like The Longest Day. It's a fictional account. It's not a documentary. It's based on a number of sources. And if you like war movies and you like something based on history, I think you'll like Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, and I, you know, it's funny you brought that up, Mitch, about Montgomery. Uh, you know, that was going to be my answer to what I didn't like about it. The, you know, it, 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 this sort of gratuitous shot out of nowhere on Montgomery, as uh, the Ted Danson's character and right. Tom Hanks's character have this kind of transitionary conversation, and it's almost like these throwaway lines. That guy's overrated, and then there's this sort of fatuous discussion of, well, you get Cherbourg, you get Paris, you get Paris, you get Berlin. And I thought, boy, if only the war really was that easy, you know, yeah. it wasn't that. But it's, you know, I think they're kind of transitioning the the moment there. But that that was probably my least favorite. I, I think the combat scenes are amazing, and that has been cutting edge in terms of how modern combat is portrayed in every good film ever since. Uh, and also Band of Brothers and the Pacific. And yep. um, as far as though, like moments in the movie that I, that I really, really like. Um, when there's this, when, when Private Ryben, Edward Burns' character is done with the mission and he's, he's angry, you know, when they're gonna let the POW go and all this business. Um, and you can see there's this kind of disciplinary moment when you know he's about to go off and rebel, and and uh, Tom Hanks, the officer, kind of looks at his NCO just very briefly, and there, there does nothing said, but the NCO character realizes he has to deal with this. And I thought that is someone who understands how military organizations work and how good officership works. Um, later on in the movie, Matt Damon's character, Private Ryan, when they're telling him about his brothers being dead and the cost of all this, and they're trying to convince him to 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 get out of there with them. Um, they say, is that what you're supposed to tell your mother when they give you another folded American flag? And he says something to the effect of, well, tell her I'm staying here with the only brothers I have left. And that really spoke to me because I thought that's, again, that's someone who understands very carefully and clearly why American combat soldiers fought in World War II, a kind of perceived sense of brotherhood among many. Mm -hmm. Well, let's face facts. Uh, it's due to Saving Private Ryan that a lot of people listen to the three of us, <laughs> mm -hmm. because you know, had Saving Private Ryan not come out, we would we would have had a much more niche audience, uh, mm -hmm. and so we, we certainly have that movie to thank for helping our careers. Mm -hmm. But you know, overall, my if you ask me to give thumbs up or thumbs down on that movie, and it's it's tough to do one or the other, but I would say thumbs down. Uh, again, I at what I hinted at before, the more. There's a direct relationship between how you view a Hollywood movie and how much you know about that subject. And, you know, I was in the middle of writing my Omaha Beach book at that time when that movie came out. And I was uh, uh, in close, close contact with the British uh, landing craft crews that brought American troops ashore on Omaha Beach. I'd say, I don't know, 30 to 40 percent of the landing craft for both the 1st Division and the 29th Division were British as were the landing craft crews of the Rangers, as, as is portrayed in the movie. But the crews were American in the movie, and it caused a tremendous tempest in Britain uh, mm -hmm. that they got that fundamental fact wrong. Uh, and, 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 and I sympathize, because it, it didn't take much to know that they were British crews, and it wouldn't have been a big effort to, 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 mm -hmm. to, to depict that, and it would have shown the... Um, the unity of the allies in this great effort. And, and another thing, um, you know, again, having studied that those opening minutes of the invasion with such, you know, fervor over my career, in general, yes, that opening scene was very powerful and it, it, it was uh, uh, a fundamental change in how war movies are done. But in terms of the opening minutes on Omaha Beach, it wasn't like that. Uh, you know, Omaha Beach is five miles long, and the, and the invasion opened with maybe a thousand men coming ashore. It's probably fewer than that. So, too many people. Um, you know, the opening minutes on the invasion, in, in my mind, in mind, it would have been a more powerful depiction of reality to show how lonely that beach was. Mm. You know, when you came ashore, just vast expanse of sand and you look to your left and your right and it might have been a handful of guys a hundred yards away and you know maybe uh, off to your right they might have been 500 yards away 
uh, but it was very deadly. But uh, again, uh, forgive me, it's part of my, you know, when you put a lifetime into studying something, anything that Hollywood does is never going to come up to your expectations. But that being said, I always raise my glass to Saving Private Ryan because it's why I'm here right now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, Joe, you and I have talked about the late Stephen Ambrose a lot and what we do and don't like. And I will always credit him for popularizing military history. I mean, for me growing up, it was Bruce Catt and mm -hmm. Civil War. But later on, um, you know, uh, Stephen Ambrose with his books and being on the History Channel every night did a lot for our careers. And I, yeah. you know, I certainly tip my hat to him. And Corneo Ryan. And for sure, I, I, his trilogy, in my mind, still can't be touched. It's incredible. And in the research material that he gathered and then yeah. made available to other scholars at Ohio yeah. University, uh, yeah. I think foundational. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would not be here had it not been for Cornelius Ryan. No yep, me too. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, one common misperception that the beach scene is not actually the opening scene of the movie. Uh, the opening scene is one of my favorites. It's cemetery. Uh, an older veteran in the cemetery uh, that we find out later is uh, is Private Ryan. Yeah. Uh, but my other favorite that always gets a lump in my throat is when they deliver the telegrams to the mother. Yeah. Yeah. Right. She falls. She just yeah. drops to her knees. And uh, yeah. that, I think, uh, Spielberg definitely got it uh, as well. And uh, you can quibble over a lot of the details, of course, but uh, I'll, I'll add to what Joe says. That's one reason a lot of people come to the National D-Day Memorial. Yeah. It's because they have seen Saving Private Ryan uh, to begin with. Well, um, we will go to some Q&A now, uh, unless you have some other points you want to uh want to throw out. We've gotten a number of comments as well as a few questions. Um, a uh, One viewer asked, uh, if you know anything that's happening with some original footage of the first waves of the D-Day invasion that have never been released to the public, uh, is that true? Do you know any of those details? I don't. I think I have pretty much poured over every single available piece of film footage related to D-Day, and certainly on Omaha, there is nothing in the opening minutes of the invasion. Now, there might have been something from a mile or two offshore, but in the, in the with the opening 50 landing craft that hit the beach at 6.30 in the morning on June 6th on Omaha Beach, nobody was carrying a camera. No. And, and you know, I mean, so if there is any footage like that or any uh, photographs, it would probably have to be somebody's private footage. It's not from a government archive or something. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, Joe, I've poured over what I think is a heck of a lot of it. I just, I don't know that it's there, but I, I would never say never because mm -hmm. it's possible it could surface somehow, but I, yeah. I don't know of any. I mean, the some of the most stunning footage um, taken on D-Day, ironically, this is a personal connection to me, it was taken by a friend of mine when I, and long before I had any interest in D-Day. When I was in elementary school in New York City, one of my classmates was named Lisa Rosenblum. And her fa she mentioned to me that her father landed on D-Day. And I always put it in the back of my mind and never thought about it. <laughs> Turned out that Walter Rosenblum was the first person to take, as far as we know, film footage on Omaha Beach. He came ashore with a still a still camera and the person who had been filming was killed and he took over the, uh, the moving camera and a lot of the classic sh uh, shots that you see are from taken by him. Mm -hmm. I believe that Walter Rosenblum took the famous shot of one of the very rare shots in World War II where you can see a man going down mm -hmm. uh, and uh, clearly that's in the first infantry division sector. I visited that part of the beach and you can almost kind of spot exactly where that film footage took place. It was kind of up uh, well east of the uh, beach per se. It was where the cliffs the cliffs came right down to the shore. Green or Fox Red. Yeah, even. Fox yeah. Red. Yeah, Fox and, Red. Uh, and uh, that that you know that film footage always touched me because here is a man heavily laden, struggling through the surf, and then 
wham, you know, he doesn't die like in a Hollywood movie. It's the reality of that always was very touching to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, my classmate's father took that film. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Stephen asks uh, a long comment, but uh, uh, I'll summarize it. Uh, first of all, uh, when we talk about D-Day, do we give enough credit to the Eastern Front? And then second part of his uh, question comment is, uh, were there alternatives? Uh, what could have been done besides the invasion? What did they have heard? Hmm. Well, you mean alternatives, uh, I guess, not invading northern France and doing something else, a Mediterranean strategy, I guess, presumably. They, I suppose they could have doubled down on operations in Italy, invaded in the Balkans and Yugoslavia, um, you know, South France, maybe straight into South France. I mean, there's a lot of other variables. Whether that made more sense, I think it's questionable. Um, of course, we, we don't give anywhere near enough attention to the Eastern Front just by the very nature of the beast. If we're talking about D-Day, we're focused on that. Um, there's no question that um, the, the Eastern Front has worn down, has ground down the German armed forces to where they are numerically smaller and qualitatively not quite as good as they once had been, though they're still incredibly formidable. Um, so it, I think it really just for me points to points out that um, World War II in Europe was a major team effort east and west. But the, obviously, I think we all know the Red Army suffers most of the casualties per capita and inflicts the majority of the damage upon the German armed forces, at least in terms of bleeding them. Right. And, um, you know, the fact that Stalin was putting a lot of pressure on Churchill and Roosevelt to help relieve his forces is a huge reason why I think the invasion happened when it did and the importance of the invasion. And you're right, John, that more recently, there's been a lot more written about the Eastern Front. And I think a lot of that has to do with archives becoming available and records that were previously closed. But, you know, as far as the greater uh, scheme of World War II, it's certainly lesser known, at least among um, Westerners. Uh, from my perspective, two points. If you go, if you take, uh, use history as an example, and let's assume that the Russians had folded in as they did in 1917, uh, and and the Germans had been able to commit everything on the on the Eastern Front to the Western. You really, really wonder where the D-Day could have happened. Mm. I mean, look at the example of 1918. The Germans deployed massive force from the Eastern Front to the Western Front when Russia gave in and uh, came very close to winning the war in March and April of 1918. Not only could the Germans have put doubled their forces in France, they would have been able to take the offensive as they did in 1918. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that didn't happen. But I, as, as to, to touch on what Mitch said, um, Stalin at the Tehran conference in November of 1943, yes, he pressed Roosevelt and Churchill. You know, he's the one who said, who's commanding overlord? And Roosevelt and Churchill were embarrassed to say, we don't know. And, and Stalin said, you don't know? This is like the major operation you guys are going with, and you don't know who is going to command it? And within a week, you know, Roosevelt picked Eisenhower. He wanted to pick Marshall. That's another story. But, you know, he picked, picked Ike. But, you know, to, to go to the Russians... Stalin did a very good thing. You know, he, he said, if you do what you say you're going to do, I will launch a major offense, offensive at the same time. And when you look at the Russian offensive in the summer of, of 1944 on the Eastern Front, it's one of the most decisive defeats the Germans suffer in all of World War II. So without that, again, you know, D-Day would have possibly been in, in some trouble. Yeah, they're getting body blows from east and west at that point. Mm -hmm. Russian Bagrati in, in the east. Um, you know, the other thing, too, now, Joe, you mentioned the Tehran Conference. And I, I think this is maybe a little aspect of it that we tend to overlook. And I, I admit that maybe where I'm coming from here, you know, is, is a product of my own research nowadays on, on the war in the Pacific. But, um, you know, of course, the, the uh, Roosevelt and Churchill knew, oh, we have to name a commander for overlord. We really got to get wings to this thing. 
um, in the wake of the Tehran conference. And so in having to do that, when they name the commander, they also have to apportion the landing craft uh, that are going to be necessary. And as you know, they're pretty scarce at that point, you know, at the end of 1943, relative to all the commitments around the globe. And so this comes at the expense of promises made to Chiang Kai-shek in China about uh, landing craft for amphibious operations in South Burma and is the beginning of the unraveling, uh, to some extent, of American relations with China. And I think we could all argue that what happens in, in China uh, you know, as a result of and after World War II is of enormous consequence. And so in some ways, um, China is the price we pay for overlord and for this victory in Europe and for the partnership with the Soviet Union and all these other aspects of World War II um, and the Germany first strategy too, in that sense too. Um, so it, it, it's interesting because it, I think it kind of pieces together. You can see this cause and effect there somewhat. Yeah. Everything's interrelated. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Cyrus uh, has commented his father was a sergeant with the 503rd Fighter Group in England, and uh, he, he said he always attested to the security. He was told, get back to the base now. And everyone knew what was coming, yet no one said a word. So I think I said something about the uh, security as well. And I'll just scroll down to the bottom here. Hey, uh, deep going. Okay, here we go. So, um, um, Mike uh, here in Bedford asks if you have visited the National D Day Memorial and uh, how effective is it at telling the story? I know uh, two of you have been because I've been here with you. Uh, but what's uh, this, and uh, for perspective, instead, this is from a former mayor of Salem so, or of uh, Bedford uh, who. Uh, uh, you know, is asking for some hometown props here, but uh, what do you think of the memorial? Oh, it's awesome. I think it's amazing. <laughs> it is absolutely visually stunning. Um, you know, if, especially if you're used to a museum, like an enclosed museum, this isn't that. This is this is this sort of sprawling acres tribute and and uh, commemoration and honorific for arguably history, modern history's greatest event. Um, I like the, the sort of recognition of so many different units and countries and the Allied coalition, um, the, the rendering of Omaha Beach uh, with the, the fountains. I mean, it's an, in, an incredibly moving place uh, that, that uh, is certainly the product of extraordinarily dedicated people from veterans on up uh, that, that have, I mean, I, I just find it very affecting when I'm there and I'd highly recommend people get there. I think every American should see it, in short. Um, and I'm a very, very lucky man because I was friendly with Bob Slaughter when th this whole mm -hmm. memorial was a gleam in his eye. He, um, late 80s, I mean, we're talking 12, 13 years before it was dedicated, he used to go to 29th Division reunions with little brochures, little tiny trifolds, and he'd say, National D-Day Memorial, and you know, he'd he say, this is what we want to do, and this is how we have to raise the money. And um, and it's so great that it, it happened. And it's obviously overwhelmingly due to Bob Slaughter, but one of the most uh, poignant moments of my life was during a 29th Division reunion. I guess it was in the mid-90s, or maybe late-90s, where we had, a, you know, every, every reunion, there's a Sunday memorial service. And uh, this was probably three years before the memorial was complete. We held the memorial service on the grounds where they just were beginning to break the earth for the memorial. And when I think of the man who sat in that memorial service, all gone now with maybe one or two exceptions, so many veterans of D-Day, it's one of the highlights of my life. Um, and, you know, at the close of that memorial so service, which they, they still do today, they read the names of every 29er who has died in the last 12 months. And I remember vividly those names being read while we looked out over the peaks of Otter and, and could try to see what was going to be there. And uh, so it, to me, it's, it's a, you know, it's always got a special place because of all those personal connections 
And although I'm remiss in not having visited yet, in the early days when the um, museum planning took place, I was fortunate enough to work with some of the researchers who came to the National Archives of College Park to go through casualty lists and unit records and, and help them. And I knew at the time how powerful this was going to be. I hadn't even, I had not yet been to Normandy, but I recognized the importance of the, the memorial. And I'm grateful to be part of the memorial today with uh, my colleagues, John and Joe. That's another uh, hometown perspective. Someone named April. Uh, put this question in. As we lose our veterans of D-Day and it becomes harder for young people to hear their stories firsthand, what do you foresee as the best way for memorials and museums to pass on their history? And what is one lesson you would want these young people to know? Wow, that's tough. I'm certainly programs like you're organizing today and I know it's it's difficult for museums to make themselves palatable to younger people, but um, having public programs like this, where you know families are encouraged to go as a group and visit, and um, you know there's so much wonderful material where I work at the National Archives. There's been a great effort underway to put the original footage that John and Joe have talked about online and photographs and the documents and that kind of thing. And uh, organizations like National History Day, I think do a great job. In fact, they, for many years, they would take a group over to, um, to Normandy. Um, and it was part of a school project and you would trace literally the footsteps of a soldier who fought and ultimately gave the, the ultimate sacrifice and ended up at the cemetery. But things I think along those lines, um, I hope are never, pushed aside, and I don't think they will be. And getting back to the Hollywood uh, things, um, I'm sure there'll be other movies in the future that relate to World War II and D-Day. Um, and that's what, like, the three of us, you know, we're influenced by those in books. I hope that continues. You know, I think what, what you're doing is perfect. And, you know, I had a similar effort with my job with the Maryland National Guard. I spent 30 years collecting records and correspondence of the people who lived this. Uh, and what appears in my books is just the tip of the iceberg. So if you're, if you're willing to investigate and visit, uh, you know, frankly, I think the primary message for the younger generation has to be one word, and that word is sacrifice. You know, that a whole generation of people, which included my father, went from you know, it went from ordinary humdrum lives, middle of the depression, you know, they didn't have much, certainly none of the creature com comforts that we have today. Uh, he led a comfortable life. He was a lawyer actually, but he was drafted as a private and ended up in a combat unit, even though he only saw out of one eye. So I'm just saying that if we can impart to the younger generation what people sacrificed in their lives, and which included their own lives when they gave them for the cause of freedom. I think that's, a, that's absolutely mandatory. We can never lose the sense that, uh, you know, a whole generation of people sacrificed a great, great deal to give us what we have today. Yeah, I think uh, human drama is always compelling. To any generation at any any time frame, no matter how young you are or whatever, of how you can be drawn in by that and relate to it as we were when we were young, um, and and World War II to us was an enormous unexplored wilderness. Um, I think we have to realize there's going to be there already are, and there are going to be a lot of young people who who will look at it the same way. And the way to 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 kind of grab them. Certainly, visually, I think museums nowadays do an incredible job with this of, of humanizing stories, and I think certainly that's a major way to do it. There's all kinds of platforms now that I would argue, you know, make this a, a much easier job in, in some ways. Uh, you know, video games and uh, displays and digital, you know, source material and, and you know, so on and so forth. Um, but I also think once we get past all that, uh, and and I, I know that the three of us have discussed this before, and I think we all, I hope I speak for us all when I say we all find it very sobering, 
you know, once the World War II generation is gone, and we really aren't very far from that day, unfortunately, um, it's kind of incumbent upon the historians to pick up the mantle and to, to tell their story or to preserve their story, whatever verb we want to use. Um, and that is an enormous responsibility in in so many ways. And I think it's one of the things that, that anima certainly anima animates me, and I think maybe Mitch and, and Joe as well, um, and leads to a sense that this is something that's very important to, to do. Right, and obviously to tell the story correctly and you know, uh, to make it interesting and to make people want to know more and to, you know, is a tribute, like you say, to the people that are not around anymore that can't speak for themselves. You, you know, that's kind of the heart and soul of what I have done in my life. I, I was very moved by the story of the U.S. General Lucian Truscott, who obviously was one of the great heroes of the Mediterranean theater. Uh, you probably know the story of his dedication speech at the Anzio U.S. Military Cemetery, and it was in the late 45, well, it's maybe 46 or 47, in which he turned his back on the audience and he gave the speech to the men who lay in the grave. And uh, that, to me, was, is one of the most moving things I've ever heard. He apologized to the men that they were not able to leave lives like like everyone who was present at this dedication. He said, I'm sorry we cut your lives short. Uh, he thanked them. And, you know, when I heard of that speech, I realized in many ways that's what drives me in my life. You know, I, 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 a day does not go by in my life when I don't realize the irony or the, the irony of the fact that a man who took a bullet on Omaha Beach and died on the sand had the bullet been one foot to the left, I could be talking to him today. Mm -hmm. So 77 years, he didn't get to live. And uh, it's really up to the people who study it, like us, to make sure that that guy who didn't get those 77 years, you know, gets his credit. And that, I think that, you know, it sounds trite, but that's what drives me in my life. Sure, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Got, a, got a comment from a Canadian viewer, which I, uh, I appreciate. He noted that Americans took the brunt of uh, the fighting on D-Day. That's true, but uh, that reminded me of another uh, another group that never gets as much attention as they deserve, the Canadians uh, in, in D-Day in Normandy. Uh, but also a uh, uh, question came in, were all the German radar stations disabled? With that many ships in the sea and planes in the sky, it's hard to think if any functional radar uh, existed and didn't pick up something. I don't know. Uh, you guys know? Well, my opinion is that obviously the German radar stations that were known, the Allies bombed the hell out of them in the weeks preceding D-Day. So if they were functional, they were lucky. And probably we were able to discern which ones were functional because if they were able to emit a, a radar signal, we could pick up that signal and know they were functional. So I would say the Germans, as a rule, were completely cowed about using their radar, knowing that they would be hammered if they did. But on a more tactical basis, I would say on the, on the night of uh, preceding the invasion, there's no doubt that uh, Allied airplanes dropped... Uh, uh, aluminum chaff all over the place uh, that completely obliterated the radar signal. So German radar, although it, some of them may have been functional, was not was not uh, effective. That's right. my understanding. Yeah, that's mine too. That it, it really, it's, you know, maybe there's some sets here and there that are operational or something, but the, the, for its intended purpose, the radar did not give the Germans a sense of where and when the fleets of planes and ships are coming at them. Also, I want to make a point related to the, the our friend that you said who said was in Canada. Uh, you know, I have to live up to what I just said about saving Private Ryan and the British crews. Um, we have to not be American centric. Uh, I think all of us would agree that uh, that the Commonwealth forces actually outnumbered American forces mm -hmm. in the initial invasion. The British and Canadians had three landing beaches. We had two. And two of the British ones were huge. The Juno uh, Beach and Gold Beach were equal to uh, Omaha in size. And um, 
Juno in particular had moments where it's, it's it paralleled the, the carnage on Omaha Beach. Uh, you know, so Americans should not look at this as, as if we were the saviors. We were not. We could not have done it without the contributions. I mean, look at Omaha Beach. We didn't have the landing crews to drop all our men on shore. We had to have a substantial number of British crews to do that. So, right. And yeah. from a naval perspective, uh, the U.S. is in the minority because the majority of our Navy is in the Pacific because right. there's major operations going on in the Pacific almost concurrently. Um, from an aerial perspective, it's more on, on par. Um, I, you know, I tend to think that per capita, I, I can't imagine any allied partner who cr contributed more than the Canadians. Mm -hmm. One of the things I tell my students is, you know, if you're an American rifle company commander in Normandy, you're starting out with about 180 guys of full strength. And of course you're suffering terrible attrition, but you're getting replacements that probably bring you back up to 60 or 70 or 80%, maybe more. If you're a Canadian company commander, you're starting out with a hundred some odd guys, almost all of whom are volunteers, because that's the rule that you could only send volunteers overseas to serve. When you get those casualties, you may or may not get replacements, and yet you're still on the line. And I, I think sometimes that's a kind of step back of saying, oh, wow, that's what that was really like for, for our allied partners. Right. And, and just driving home the point of June 6th, it's just one day of a very long campaign. And when people go to Norman, they often just focus on D-Day, the day, and the breakthrough and, and trying to get off the beach and all of the fighting for the next 30 to 60 days is, is somewhat ignored. And I think it's important, um, you know, to look at the campaign overall and not just the one day. Absolutely. And beyond. Yeah. You know, I mean, in Normandy, just the beginning. You got right. a whole year long so, campaign. Yeah, it's, um, you know, almost a year later before finally the capitulation. Well, we are about out of time. Uh, some other questions came in. I apologize. We don't have time for all of them. But uh, this has been absolutely tremendous, a, a, a great uh, delight for me just to sit and listen to the three of you discuss. Um, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of you who have uh, – uh, tune in to watch or who will tune in to watch after the fact and um, it's a final reminder that of course uh, this Sunday 77th anniversary it's worth pausing to think about what had happened what it meant and uh, what how the the uh, reverberations of what happened on June 6 1944 still shape our lives uh, but again thank you John Mitch Joe uh, for your participation and uh, we hope we will see you all in Bedford soon. You will. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank hope you. to be there. Yep. Okay.